Oh, well, thank you, Tatiana. Amen. Beautiful voice. Praise God. Amen. Yeah. Well, good morning, everybody. How are we? Good. That's good. You know, I, uh, Michael, our elder, asked me um, this morning, just, just when we were at the back there, uh, just before we came up, whether there was any ritual that I go through before I come up to preach. And it reminded me of a preacher whose ritual would be that he, before he would come up to preach he, and he wanted to relax and calm his nerves, so he would do a set of push-ups. As he came to this church and uh, he had a quiet moment just before he had to come up and uh, he was on his own at, at the back. And so as his usual custom was, he, he got down and he began to do his push-ups. And he'd do a series of push-ups. Unbeknownst to him that there was a curtain, it was one of, those, uh, one of those churches where there would be, a instead of a wall like this, there, there was actually a curtain. But the curtain did not reach to the very bottom. And so as he went down to the bottom with his push-ups, he could see below the edge of the curtain. And he looked across... And there, sitting in the very front row, was one of the dear elderly members, sisters of the church. And the pastor thought, oh dear, this is really embarrassing. And so after the, after the service, he, he went up to the lady and he said, oh, you know, he, he thought, oh, I really have to explain, you know, this is, this is just embarrassing, this is terrible. And the lady, you know, she took him by the hands and said, oh, pastor, it was so good to see you kneeling down so frequently to pray before you preach. <laughs> Fortunately, Michael didn't wait to hear what my ritual is. <laughs> well, there you go. It's time for the closing hymn. <laughs> Very good. Let's try I think they're trying to get it going. Is it? Ken did ask me how dependent I was on it, and uh, I said, well, as long as I had some notice, I would be right. But I can see that they're readjusting. Thank you guys for working in the back to get that, get that sorted. As they're getting that sorted, I wanted to begin by asking you a question. Hopefully it'll come up in a moment. They're feverishly looking at the screen. Hopefully it will, it will work. Whilst we wait for that, I, I should say that was quite inspiring hearing about Helen Hall, wasn't it? And unbeknownst to me, she has a connection here with Mount Gravatt Church, according to, to, to what um, Ken just mentioned to me a bit earlier. I reckon that's probably the, one of the earliest memories I have is remembering and hearing her experiences. And uh, one of the most moving moments in my life was when Helen came back to Australia on one of her visits and uh, shared uh, reports and shared some photos of her, her experiences in uh, over, over there at the school where she has worked, when, where she has spent the better part of her life. And just to hear this morning, where's Margaret? Uh, yeah, just to hear if, if that's the case, she's now going to remain there for the rest of her life. That truly is, is yeah, that's, that's, that's very moving. And I guess for someone like myself, who's spent a, a, only a tiny bit in mission service, I have an incredible appreciation for someone like that who has served and continue to serve at, at, at that ripe age. Are you going to preach for us this morning, brother, instead? No, no, no. 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 Let's yeah. Number one. Yeah. Well, like, I wanted to ask you a few questions while we wait for the PowerPoint. Uh-huh, okay. Work. So, what do you if do it doesn't, during we the can week? Preach. What do I do during the week? Yeah. There we go. What do you do during the week? Can you I introduce a little bit, tell us who you are, what do you get up to? I do push-ups. <laughs> oh, man. Look no, at that. Look no. at the guns. No, not enough. Not enough. <laughs> Um, so I'm currently in the role of uh, General Secretary for the conference. Yep. Oh, well, General Secretary. And what does it mean for 
some people may not know what a general secretary do. What does it mean in the Adventist context? So that our church is organised in such a way that a group of churches are put together in a region, such as a, we call it here a, a conference, and uh, we have an administrative office that, that oversees that with three officers, president, secretary, and the chief financial officer. So I'm one of the three officers working with the leaders um, in the administration of our, of our churches. We have something like 100, 110 congregations across South Queensland, uh, seven schools, four aged care facilities, and uh, my role specifically involves uh, the administrative side of things, um, uh, working in um, the, uh, the, the setup of, of, of the, the, the executive committee, the, the boards for the, for the schools and for the aged care facilities, and um, yeah, assisting the, the leadership in, in that area. So under that, there's, there's other very specific things which I won't bore you with, such as um, you know, human resources, uh, yeah. policies, Compliance. So you must be pretty busy things. during the week and even busier now. Yeah. Okay. Now, we're still having technical difficulties. I will ask you one more question. Yeah. But do you have your PowerPoint by any chance in a USB drive? Is it over there? Because <laughs> I, do. I don't think it's corrupted the file. I think that's the problem. Do, do you have it near? Oh, can Some you get it from you? Like, look, I, there's going to be another special item by. <laughs> <laughs> No. So thank you, Joseph. I'm sorry about the technical difficulties. So, hey, is it awesome to uh, be together with God, God today? Sermons and sermons I was really blessed by that special item. And, you know, I'm really blessed to see somebody that has so much in their plate to come to our church. Uh, thank you very much for that. Now, so you told us about your work life. Mm. What about family life? Do you have... You're a single man, obviously. Yeah. No. No. no? Married. Okay. My wife is sitting over there. <laughs> Allison. Happily Allison. married to Allison. Yeah. And we have two girls, and they've spread around the congregation today. So Lena is 19. I'm going to embarrass her. She's over there uh, <laughs> with the young people, and um, she's uh, currently having a gap year. And uh, and Marilla is over on the right on this side. <laughs> um, so we are a one very close, united family, as you can see. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think today is the first time they've actually spread out this far. So. And, uh, like, you have your family. Where were you born? And, like, where were you born? In Australia, outside mm. Australia? Where, where did you grow up? Here, right here, in Brisbane. In Brisbane? So, yeah. So, um, uh, born in Brisbane. And uh, I actually started school. Um, yeah, here at Brisbane, uh, well, it was called then Mount Gravatt Adventist Primary School, I believe. Uh, just started school there, just, just the f uh, six months, and then my parents moved out to, uh, to near Stanthorpe, and that's where oh, I grew up. So, yeah. You grew up in the Stanthorpe. Yeah. Yeah, we, we had church camp over there. It was a mm. lovely part of the world. And from uh, Stanthorpe, where did you, you went to obviously do a degree? On, um... Yeah, so uh, that's when I started, yeah, went and studied for ministry, and since then I've been privileged enough to serve in, in a number of different places, different conferences around Australia, and a brief stint overseas. Well, thank you very much. I think we have it all fixed up now, and may God bless you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Billy. And uh, thank you to the people at the back. Uh, they have got it working, and that's, that's great. What I wanted to begin by by this morning is to ask you the question, if you were to think of paradise, what would, what would readily come to your mind? And I guess for most people, it would be a tropical island, wouldn't it? Uh, sitting in the shade of a palm tree, uh, enjoying the cool breeze that comes off the ocean. And so for many people, that would be what they would consider paradise. Now, for some people, uh, paradise would be being in the midst of a garden, whether that be a beautiful green uh, lush area with flowers, or whether it be a more of a garden where you're growing fruits and, and vegetables. But not everybody is a green thumb. Not everybody is a nature lover, true? So for them, that would not be paradise. Maybe this would be more your paradise, <laughs> where you would enjoy the delights and the sweets of the world's best chocolate. Then again, it could be that paradise for you would be to own the keys to a vehicle like this and let it rip on the road. Huh? Perhaps for some of our ladies here, 
this would be paradise for you. Then, of course, you can go to some places where they actually create such an atmosphere that people really, uh, where they really want you to think that this is, that this is, that this is paradise. And uh, you can go in there and enjoy it and, and pretend that you are, that you are in, in paradise. Now, of course, if you believe Hollywood, it will tell you that all you need to do, enjoy paradise, is to be like a street urchin, come thief, who falls in love with, with a princess and gets to marry her. And once you're with her, it is, it is paradise. As, as the song uh, used in this movie says, you know, it's all about a whole new world with new horizons to pursue. I'll chase them anywhere. There's time to spare. Let me share this whole new world with you. A whole new world. That's where we'll be. A thrilling chase for you and me. Of course, the first and the real paradise was in the beginning. We refer to it as the, as the, garden, as the garden of Eden, the Garden of Eden. Now, the Bible only gives a little hint of what the Garden of Eden was like, but let's have a look at it at least as we, as we kick off. So, open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, or if you've only got a smartphone, then open the, the app, the Bible app, and come with me to Genesis. We go right to the beginning. Actually, chap, chap, chapter 2. Chapter 1 describes how in six days God created the heavens and the earth, how He forms it in an integral way, and then how He fills it. And we get a little snippet of a description of what that uh, Garden of Eden looked like. If we read in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 8, and the Bible tells us, and the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made up to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden and there it divided and became, it became Four rivers. So we have a little snippet of what the original paradise was like. But if we go to the book Patriarchs and Prophets, we get a bit more of an insight into what it was like. And let me share this with you uh, this morning. Notice uh, what she says. She says, As the earth came forth from the hands of its maker, it was exceedingly beautiful interspersed with mountains, lovely lakes, delicate flowers greeted the eye, the air clear and healthful. Notice that, man was holy and happy. Everything that God had made was the perfection of beauty. Nothing lacked that could contribute to the happiness of Adam and Eve. Yet the Creator gave them still another token of His love by preparing a garden especially for their home. In this garden were trees of every variety. Many of them, she says, they're laden with fragrant and deli delicious fruit. In the midst of the garden stood the tree of life. And look at this. Its fruit appeared like apples of what? Gold and silver. No taint of sin or shadow of death marred the fair creation. Did you pick the description? Did you, did you see what this, this was like? You know, let me just highlight a couple of the key things. Exceedingly beautiful, yeah? Perfection of beauty. And that's why the Bible says, when God created everything, Genesis chapter 1, you'll have it there in verse 31, at the end of a creation, and God saw all that he had made, and it was... Very good. But as beautiful as Eden was, that was not the real reason that it was paradise. Do you know what the real reason was? The real reason is that humans were in direct communion with God. 
they were in his presence. And as long as they remained loyal to him, they would be able to remain in paradise. So long as they stayed obedient to God, they were able to maintain that direct access, that, that communion. They would be able to, to enjoy paradise. And notice, notice Ellen White, you know, she actually makes this incredible statement. I want you to notice this. She said that as long as they stayed in communion with God, uh, humans' capacity to know, to enjoy, and to love would what? Continually increase. Did you get that? It would continue to improve and flourish and they would continue to grow and love and develop as long as they maintained their allegiance to God. Of course, that's why. So paradise was paradise because humans were with God. That's of course why when they did disobey, they lost that direct access. They lost that direct access to God. We read of that tragic event in Genesis chapter 3. Let's have a look at it together, Genesis chapter 3. And uh, of course, we, we pick it up here in verse 7. Of course, this is, this is following after when, uh, when, when Eve took of the fruit that God had said not to touch and not to eat, and she gave to Adam, and they, they, they disobeyed God. And we pick it up from, from verse 7 onwards. The Bible tells us here, then that the eyes of both were opened and they realized that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together to make themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. The Lord God called to man and said, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid. Because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And what does the man do? The man says, the, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the fruit. Do you see what's going on here? As soon as they disobey, there are immediate consequences. They, they, there's nakedness. It wasn't an issue before. They, they're under that covering up. There is shame. Uh, God comes looking and there is fear. There, there is hiding. And there is blame, isn't there? And so we read on. Verse, uh, let's go down to ver verse 17. Verse 17. God says to Adam, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of, all the, eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow uh, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For, dust, for you are dust and to dust you shall return. You see there is immediate consequences. And as a result humans no longer have access to paradise. Verse 23, verse 23 here, one more verse here we see, therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden. There was a brokenness caused here by human, human disobedience. By sin. Perfect, perfect communion with God was broken. The relationship with one another between each other as humans is broken. Do you see that as well? And nature itself is no longer the same. You see, sin caused a brokenness that has affected the human race ever since then, friends. The only thing is, can I add here? The only thing, well, the thing, the, the thing is these days is we don't tend to want to call it as sin. We have every other label and diagnosis except for what it ultimately is. And so all kinds of aberrant behavior is, is described, well, they're just somewhere on the spectrum. Or 
it's dysphoria or it's mental health or whatever or, and we all have a tendency to want to seek approval and value it through our possessions through our performance through our through our appearance but friends sin sin is costly Sin is a brokenness. It's, it's a brokenness of the heart that, that occurs here that's affected everyone and everything ever, ever since then. As, as I like it d- described, you know, sin, sin is not just a slip-up. It's not just like, whoops, we've spilled some milk on the floor, let's, let's mop it up. No, sin is costly, it is deadly, and therefore the only way to fix it is it required the Creator Himself. And we get a hint of it here in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, of course, the first messianic prophecy where God said I will put enmity between you and the woman between your offspring and her offspring he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel you know that's why it says there in patriarchs and prophets that Adam had enjoyed open communion with his maker but sin brought separation between God and man and the atonement of Christ alone could span the abyss And then pointing to how that was going to be done, the sacrificial offerings were a perpetual reminder of sin and the cost to restore restore that. So come with me now to Exodus chapter 25. The next significant passage I want us to notice here, Exodus, Exodus chapter 25. And uh, we're going to read here verse 8. Exodus chapter 25 and verse 8. And God here says, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. God instructed his people to build a, to build a sanctuary. It's also called in some places a, a tabernacle. Originally, it was just a tent. He says, make, let them make me a sanctuary. Why? That I may dwell among them. To dwell among them. God is wanting to restore the broken communion that existed in paradise. He wants, he wants to dwell amongst his people. But because of sin, it's no longer possible to have that face-to-face communion as, it, as there was in paradise. And so he sets up, he sets up the sacrificial system. And it was, it was through this that they were able to, to have God's presence uh, uh, among them. Now, uh, of course, it was, it, it was, it was through, through the blood, and so it was through the, through the animal sacrifices. The blood was the means by which people could approach God. Blood was the reminder of the cost of repairing the relationship. Does that make sense? But even that, even then access, if we go back, access, access to God was limited. The sanctuary, as is, some of you would be aware, it had two rooms. It was a holy place and then uh, in, to which only the priest would go in and they'd take blood in. And then inside that was a, a, another special room called the most holy place in which contained the Ark of the Covenant. And it is in that room where God's presence would come. Not God himself, it's not possible, to, in, in, you know, with physical humans, but God's presence would come in the form of a cloud. And in that room, the ho- no one dared enter except the high priest, and even then only once a year. So access to God was, 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 uh, was limited, friends. It was limited and restricted by daily sacrifices that had to be repeated. And we could say that access, access was veiled. The curtain in the temple was there to make it possible for people to have God's presence at least among them. God veils himself so humans could have a means by which which they could approach him. And it is through the, the repeated sacrifices, through the shedding of blood time and again, that, they were, that was only made, made way that they could, they could get in. Because, as it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. But then God, then God did something incredible. 
Let's go, to, let's go over to Matthew chapter 1. Notice, notice here, Matthew chapter 1. We have here described the birth, the birth of Jesus. Matthew chapter, chapter 1, and uh, we'll go from verse 21. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, the Bible says, referring to, here to, to Mary, she will bear a son. You got it there, Matthew 1, 21? She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. What do we say sin was? Sin was that brokenness, that separation that separated man from, man from God. It was deadly, it was costly, and it could only be repaired by the Son of God. Let's read on, verse 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. Do you see what's going on here? God with us. God wants to restore the relationship with humanity. And he does that by becoming a human so that he can dwell, dwell among us. Now, connect this over with John chapter 1. Come over with me to John, John chapter 1. Very interesting verse here, John chapter 1. And, uh, and verse 14. John chapter 1, verse 14. And the Word, capital W, who was Jesus? God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. What did God say in Exodus 25? Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. God, friends, God desires to dwell, to commune with people, and he's seeking to restore that communion. Paradise was paradise because God could dwell with them face to face, you're right? So he establishes a sanctuary so he can dwell amongst them, but now he comes in person and he dwells among us. Where it says dwell among us, some versions say the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. That's what Jesus did when he came down to to this earth we cannot conceive of the distance of god condescending to become a human we, we we cannot conceive of that someone's used the analogy that if you've got a little let's say you've got a little goldfish some of you may have a, like a little little goldfish at home and you think of the the difference that there is and the, the, the between you and that little goldfish you magnify that a hundred times and still we don't get the, the chasm between god becoming a human being and yet he does. He comes down to this world. He becomes one of us. He understands us. He can sympathize with us. Why? Because God wanted to restore, restore the communion. One of the, the um, I'm not sure when, how familiar you are with the classic on the life of Jesus by the, the book called Desire of Ages, one of the best books ever written. And one of the most profound statements in that book is in, on page 25 where she says this, in Christ we become more united to God than if we had never fallen. Did you get, just get that? That's incredible. She says Jesus has bound himself to humanity by a tie that is never to be broken. God gave Jesus not only to bear our sins, he gave him to the fallen race. In Christ, the family of earth and the family of heaven are bound together. What do you say? And it even goes further. As, uh, as some of us would have studied last week in the Sabbath school, the, pa the, the, the profound passage in the, in, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, in verse 6, it says that in Christ, he ha we are seated in Christ in heavenly places now now by faith but we're not in paradise yet so therefore come with me to revelation 21 revelation 21 and the the second last chapter of the bible 
the first and the second chapter of the Bible describes the original paradise. And here we come to the second last chapter and the last chapter where paradise is restored. Revelation chapter 21 and uh, let's, let's, let's look here, friends, and uh, I just really want to bring this out. Uh, um, just follow with me. Revelation 21 from the start, he uh, says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Here we have a description of the new heaven and the new earth, the new Jerusalem. Why Jerusalem? Why is it a city? And what is this reference describing it as a bride? Well, interestingly enough, the Bible began with a wedding, doesn't it? And it ends with a wedding. It symbolizes the kind of relationship that God wants to have, have with his people. Well, that's, that's why it's, it's compared to a bride. But, 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 but why a city? Cities aren't often considered as paradise, are they? Or the most beautiful places around. So let's notice some of the details, if you like, of this city. Come down with me to verse, verse 12. Just, just a couple of bits that we, could, we, we can highlight. Verse 12, it says that this great city... Had, uh, it had a great high wall with 12 gates and at the gates 12 angels and the gates and on the gates sorry the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed who were these 12 tribes of Israel they were the 12 sons of Jacob now, how familiar are, are you familiar with what these 12 sons of Jacob were like, yeah? What kind of characters were they? Do you need me to remind you? Do you need to go back to Genesis 37, 38, 39? Vengeful, murderous, violent. Let's just put it very mildly. They were, they were quite morally dubious. And yet their names are inscribed eternally on the gates on the entry to the eternal city of God. Why, friends? Why? It's to show that this is a place where anyone by the grace and forgiveness of God can come in. And then verse 14, verse 14, same thing. The wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the 12 names of what? The 12 apostles of the Lamb. The 12 apostles were, you know, the 12, the 12 disciples. Similarly, were not a likely bunch for the foundation of God's city. What were the 12 disciples like? One was a tax collector. Another one was, a couple of them were sons of thunder. That one was impetuous and one was doubting. The point here, friends, is that the new heaven and the new earth, the, the, the paradise restored will be filled with people Sinners saved by grace like you and I. But there's one more detail I want to notice. I want you to notice. One more detail. Verse 16. It says that the city lies four square. Its length, the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod, and depending on which version you got, but it says here 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. What shape is the New Jerusalem? Do we have any math students here? Any, any, any physics? Anyone here amongst you guys here? If its length and its width and its height is the same, what shape is it? It's a cube. What's the significance of the new Jerusalem being a cube? Now, for one thing, that means that it's perfect in every, and equal in every, in every, every respect. But, 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 but why a cube? Come with me to 1 Kings chapter 6. 1 Kings chapter 6. Back, back here where we find the description 
of Solomon's temple. King Solomon, the one who got to build the temple, right? Uh, this was, this was the, the, one of the most incredible structures considered perhaps back then as one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. A magnificent edifice. After it had been a, a, a tent for so many years, he builds a permanent structure. And the description is given here of the construction of the temple with the, with the rooms that it had, the holy place. And here we come now to the description of the most holy place in verses 19 and 20. 1 Kings chapter 6. 1 Kings chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. The inner sanctuary, it says, the inner sanctuary he prepared in the innermost part of the house to set there the ark of the covenant of the Lord. So we're talking about the most holy place, aren't we? Verse 20, what does it say? The inner sanctuary was 20 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 20 cubits high. What shape is the most holy place? It's a cube. It's a cube. We come to the new Jerusalem. Paradise restored. And the entire new Jerusalem is in the shape of a cube. Why? Because the entire new Jerusalem now is, if you like, the most holy place. We are going to be literally in the very presence of God himself. That's why it is paradise restored. Unrestricted access, direct communion. That's why it says, let's, let's, let's just flick back one last time, back to Revelation 21. That's exactly why it tells, tells us there, after it, it gives us these, these descriptions of, of the city and... Uh, and, and that reference that it's, it, that it's a, in, in the shape of a cube, for us to get the sense that the, enti in the entire city, we're in the most holy place, we're in the very presence of God, fully there restored. That's why then it says in Revelation 21 and verse 22, uh, John in vision says, And I saw no temple in the city, for, the, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. There is no temple because the entire place, if you like, is the temple, or more specifically, the entire place is the most holy place. Paradise, paradise restored. My friends, if you think, one last thought, if you think that paradise will be spent will be a place where we spend eternity sitting on a cloud and playing a harp. Think, think again. Think again. Because, do you remember, do you remember at, in the original paradise, what it was, how it was described for humans, what they were doing? They were to grow, to love, and continue to increase. Well, one of the most sublime words are the words that you find at the very end of the book, Great Controversy. And notice what it, what it says here, describing, describing if you like, uh, paradise, paradise restored. Notice this, there, referring to the new earth, it says, with delight that has no end, immortal minds will study the wonders of creative power, the mysteries of redeeming love. Every aspect of mind will be developed, every capacity increased. Learning will not exhaust the energies. Notice this then, the redeemed may carry on the grandest enterprises reach the highest aims, fulfill their noblest ambitions, and still they will find new heights to conquer, new wonders to admire, new truths to comprehend, fresh objects to draw out the powers of the mind and soul and body. Did you get that? Let me just underscore a couple of these key things where it talks about that throughout paradise, throughout eternity, sorry, in paradise, every capacity increased. We're going to carry on the grandest enterprises, highest aims, new wonders, new truths. In other words, friends, we will be able to continue what we're doing and enjoy it and grow and develop and keep on learning. Friends, that is the best of both worlds in the truest sense. Because it'll be without any of the side effects that we suffer here now.
in my job, I've tended to travel around a little bit and been away from my wife for periods of time. Probably the longest period that I've been away was a period, it was a period of about six weeks. This is going back a few years and uh, look, we did keep in touch, but that was the old days. We certainly didn't have a mobile phone on me and the, the instant direct uh, calls uh, at, at that time. Yes, we, we sent the odd, you know, some messages and I'd go to internet cafes and type the emails and send them off and then following day come back and check and see if there was a reply back from her and catch up on news from home. The leader of our group had a mobile phone and he kindly allowed me to make a phone call. I can still remember the, just the joy it gave me to be able to actually speak to my wife and, and hear her voice. And this was going back a bit and mobile phones were downright expensive, particularly an overseas call. And I don't know how long we spoke for, probably just a couple of minutes, that was all that we, you, you sort of did back then. Anyway, once the trip were kind of finished and uh, everything uh, was sorted out and the paperwork after the trip, I, 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 got, um, I got sent a portion of the bill uh, so to pay for that particular phone call and it was, I won't tell you the exact amount, but it was a hideously expensive amount for just a two minute phone call. And so whilst we had some communication, that was good, but let me tell you, friends, that there was no substitute to when we were back together again in, purpose, in, in person. Why? Because I loved her, and I knew she loved me, and we're meant to be together face to face. You know, God has been separated from humans, not for six weeks, but for some 6,000 years. And he desires to be with us. Now, yes, we do hear from him through, through the scriptures and occasionally from, by a direct message, but the best will be when we, when we are with him face to face. Paradise will be paradise because we will be with God directly in his, in his presence. And it'll be the best of both worlds because it'll be, we, we will be, we, we, we'll continue to grow, develop and learn and, 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 and reach these ideals. So no matter who you are or what you're good at or what you enjoy, paradise will give you the opportunity to grow and develop and excel in that and keep on excelling it throughout eternity without any of the side effects that we suffer here on this planet. And unlike as our society considers paradise just a fairy tale. Friends, the biblical paradise is no fairy tale. It's not a pie in the sky. It is a reality, and it's a reality. We can be certain of that because Jesus himself is a historical, real figure. The question that remains for you and I simply is, have you accepted Christ's work of restoration? Because you see, paradise will be paradise because we will be with God. Eternity will only be for us if we know God now as our best friend. Do you know him? Have you committed your life to him? If you haven't, my appeal to you would be, do it. Do it today. Face to face with Christ my Saviour. Face to face what will it be? When with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ, who loved me so. But then it says this. Only faintly now I see him. That's true. That's true. We have the word. We have scripture. We have prayer. That's only faintly. Only faintly now we see him with the darkened veil between. But a blessed day is coming when his glory shall be seen. May God bless you all. Amen.